Welcome to the crash course on deep learning. We're going to look at the attention mechanism and transformers this time. So the first thing that we need to do is consider exactly how attention works, what it does, and why it might be useful for your problems at hand. Then we'll review transformers, and in the end we'll look at an applications of the latter. So attention per se, essentially address one of the key problems in an encoder-decoder setting in deep learning. Let's say I have an encoder, and for images, well, you know, that's basically, you know, the various layers of your confnet that extract some meaningful features. That thing gets mapped into a softmax layer, and then, you know, you decode, for instance, that this is a cat. So that's very convenient. And, you know, you could argue whether it's just at the last layer, whether the decoder happens or not, but that's kind of semantics. In the same way for sentiment estimation in, you know, text, you can go and, you know, use the input sequence and then maybe an LSTM, maybe a bi-directional LSTM, and then you generate some symbol and you say, well, okay, so that's my estimate of the sentiment. And so I basically have a finite dimensional representation that I can use before the decoding happens. So in other words, I have an input, I have an encoder, I get some state, and then the decoder takes that state, possibly with some additional input or some additional query to produce an output. And this has been used for instance, for machine translation. So sequence to sequence for machine translation did exactly that. So you encode the original sequence into some hidden LSTM state, and then you start spooling off the translated, let's say, French version, Bonjour le monde. Um, now, this is great for short sequences where a hidden state of, let's say, a hundred or a thousand or whatever number of dimensions is an accurate representation of all possible short sentences. But what if the sentence is very long? Or what if the sentence is very long, has a lot of side sequence sentences and maybe mistakes and maybe some non sequiturs and maybe some other things and maybe it keeps on going on rambling and rambling. So just like the sentence that I just said, which is a very long one, it is highly unlikely that there is a nice finite dimensional representation for that that could also be used for short, concise, and meaningful ones. In other words, we are going to run out of steam if we limit ourselves to finite dimensional input representation. Well, actually the input, but the intermediate state. Another problem occurs if you have non-uniform word ordering. So, for instance, in German, you sometimes split up a verb and parts of the verb is at the beginning, parts of the verb is at the end, and so only when you hear the full sentence will you be able to figure out what, you know, you really meant. Germans are kind of notorious for that, and so translating into German or back from German into something else is really difficult because you need to know what's going on at the end in order to do anything at the beginning. <clears throat> and traditionally, people have tried to learn, let's say, word alignment mechanisms and, you know, appropriate alignment matrices and reordering and so on. But this is really a mess. So the question is a little bit whether we can do something smarter. And actually, if you think about it, the answer is kind of really staring in your face, right? So after all, you still have that input sequence. And if I could just always go back to that input sequence and look up, okay, I've translated this piece so far, which other piece do I need to translate? Um, I could operate on much longer sequences, much longer sentences. I could quite reasonably deal with different word orders. All those things would get a lot easier if I could just every once in a while pick at the original sentence again. And mind you, this is exactly what the attention mechanism 
uh, proposed to solve. So the attention layer explicitly selects related information. So it basically has a memory that consists of key value pairs. The keys are used for a query. The values are what you use to retrieve. That notion comes from you know, databases and other things. In some cases, keys and values are the same thing. But in any case, anyway, <clears throat> you basically have a current state. You use that to query which of the key value pairs and in which weighted combination you pick. And then you use that weighted combination to give you the appropriate output. Okay. So this sounds super abstract. Let's actually look at what this looks like in detail. So I have some query, I have some keys and some values. They can all live in different spaces. And then I have some function alpha such that alpha i will give me the scores associated with you know, the query Q and the corresponding keys. And then I get, you know, an answer as an output as a weighted combination of the values VI times alpha I of the query and maybe this particular key and all the other keys. Okay. So different choices of alpha will give me different attention layers and there are like two or three that are sensible and it's probably not worth over-engineering this too much because most of them do a good job. One option, for instance, is to take inner products between queries and keys, right? And you renormalize appropriately, or you can use maybe hyperbolic tangent. So basically you have some MLP where you take an inner product between, you know, the keys and the queries and the values, and then you just apply softmax, and then you get the appropriate scores, and then you get the answer, right? So all of this works, and it works reasonably well. So to actually look at that in practice, what I'm getting is I have my encoder, and so I then get, you know, some initial state, and then that initial state forms my first query, and using the attention mechanism, I read out what I need to do from there to generate an output. And then I use that possibly as an input again to generate another output. And I keep on doing this overall. Um, here's a bit more detail. So I have basically an embedding. I have a couple of recurrent layers, possibly. Then I get the attention mechanism, which allows me to then, you know, feed the state of the recurrent layer to the recurrent layer for the decoder, and that can then be used to emit a new character. So the specific way how various data flows are mapped really depends on the paper that you're reading. But by and large, what you do is you use attention to selectively look at state that you've ingested before to decide what to query. If you have, you know, a deep recurrent neural network, you want to do that at every level such that you can appropriately get different levels of abstraction in the representation. And you then use the symbol that you decoded also as an input for the next decoding and you keep on going, right? And this allows you to build machine translation models that work a lot better. Now, <clears throat> attention thus allows you to go non-parametric where my state that I'm operating on may be non-parametric, but the mechanism, namely the function that I'm using to operate on the state is still finite dimensional. So this is a big improvement. And you might think that, okay, this is totally novel. It actually turns out that this has a lot of precursors. So for instance, things like what's an Adaria estimator and so on um, correspond to that. Um, so there are a bunch of book chapters that you can use to read up on this in detail. So there's actually a new attention mechanisms chapter that's coming up on the D2L book. You should check that out for a lot more detail and information on how to peruse it. Okay, so that concludes the 
intro to attention. There is a full tutorial from ICML that we gave a couple of years ago um, that would have a lot more details in there. Um, feel free to use that too if you want to go through three to four hours of attention, if you have enough attention for that.